All right. Hi, and welcome to the first Linguistic Society event. I'm here interviewing uh, Tony Thorne, who is visiting consultant at King's College London and a researcher in contemporary slang. From 1991 to 2007, he was director of the Language Centre at King's um, and writes interviews on uh, broadcasts extensively on slangs and languages of subcultures. And we are lucky to um, be one of the people he's interviewing with. Uh, so, Tony, thank you for being here. Well, thank you very much for the, the invitation. Um, so if we could get into it. Um, very glad to have you here. Uh, what is a slang? Well, it's funny because um, most people think they know what slang is, and they know they know what a slang word is if they hear it. But nobody, and this may be surprising, nobody has ever successfully defined slang. And I, I've been to conferences. I, I remember one conference in particular where we debated how to define slang for academics and specialists and, and ordinary people. We debated it for a whole weekend and we never reached a conclusion. And I think this is silly because we, we know what slang is. I've tried to define it. And I think you normally define it in two ways. Um, it starts out as an in-group language, a, a sort of private, secret, restricted code that's developed among small groups of people, peer groups, we call them, groups of friends, people who have the same interests. Um, linguists call them speech communities or micro communities. And these groups, whoever they are, sailors, school kids, criminals, uh, gamers, any of any people who operate in these niches tend to develop their own language. And um, it, 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 so that's a very important part of slang is it's an in-group language, which people in the out-group, as linguists describe it, often just can't understand. But it has other functions. It can be deliberately a secret language so that it's not understandable by outsiders like teachers or parents or police officers. So it's designed to keep outsiders out. It's also designed, this is a very strong uh, element of slang, to create identities. And if you can speak the slang of your group, you have status. You are an insider, you're a member of the group. And those people outside automatically have less status because they can't understand your, your group's language. So it's, it's all about creating um, status, identity. It can be about being secret, um, it, about excluding others and including yourself. But then there's one other aspect of slang, which I think is always part of it. This is a very complicated answer, I know, but uh, it's novel. It, it always seems to derive its power from being very, very informal, sometimes shockingly informal, and it has that kind of edginess, that sort of controversial um, alternative aspect. Um, it can also be funny, but it, it always relies on being novel or appearing to be novel. So it's it's always sort of new language. And I'm sorry if that's very complicated, but maybe you can see why it's been so difficult to come up with a neat definition. Um, so in studying slang, you're studying all these different things. Um, what, uh, why study slang? What does it tell us about society and importantly about language? Um, well, I think that's a really good question. And I think I'm still in a way surprised and in a way disappointed that not many traditional academics, research-based academics, actually do study slang. A lot of young people are interested in slang. Students, school students, university students, I want to learn more about it. I think that slang, and I spent years sort of trying to convince people that slang isn't a deficient kind of language. Even if it's seen as socially outsider, slang is, if you look at it as a, as a variety of language or a speech variety, 
it's um, it's very very creative. It uses slang, uses rhetoric and metaphor and the technical possibilities of a language in very creative ways. It's very very much the same as the way literature and poetry uses language. It isn't the same. Some people have said, oh, slang is the poetry of the people. It isn't the same as poetry. Poetry is, can be all about allusions, about, about imprecise, sort of mysterious meaning. Slang isn't about that at all. It's about very definite meanings and communication, but it uses all of the tricks of literature and poetry. So it's far from being a deficient kind of language. I, I think it's a very exciting, creative variety of language. So that's, that's uh, I think, one very good reason to study. There are also psychological and social aspects to studying slang, which I think are very important. And I think sociolinguists more and more are looking at slang and the language particularly of, of outsider and insider groups and of you. Because it, slang tells us what these groups of people, whoever they are, young people, people into gaming, people into fashion, um, stan culture, fans, um, uh, fan fiction enthusiasts, what all of these people are doing um, in order to understand what they're up to. You have to understand the language and also what they're thinking. And I think uh, this can be especially important even because I think it's important. I think, I've always thought, I, I want to know what my students, what my children, what um, I'm talking particularly about young people, but it can be older people, what uh, what criminals, um, what, what even, what working people, business people are talking about. And it's a way into their intimate lifestyles. And I think that's another very important aspect of slang. So um, in, in this more technical sense, is the, um, because none of us write the way we speak, going to an academic conference or something is very different to what, what we'd say anywhere else. Is jargon um, itself a kind of slang that establishes the same in-group between academics and, or, or is this a slightly different, different kind of phenomenon? No, no, I think there's a lot, um, there's no clear dividing line between jargon and slang because the sort of people, the sort of buzzwords that business people um, tend to use um, in the office, sometimes that's technical language, but very often it's intimate, informal language and exotic. It looks and sounds exotic to outsiders. So in those ways, it's just like slang. The only difference I think is slang is normally used to describe the very informal and, and perhaps unorthodox language, whereas jargon can be, um, it can be a sort of technical way of describing what you're doing. So it's perhaps a bit more, it appears a bit more legitimate, but they're both all about um, creating an in-group identity. And, and, and also there's, a, there's another function. Slang and jargon give these groups a vocabulary to describe things for which standard normal English has no words. It's like dating jargon. There's a lot of that around now about, you know, I'm, I'm too old to get into it, in, into it but um, certainly the practice, but the language is interesting. All these words like cuffing and shipping, um, talking about the kind of intricate technicalities of dating and they're invented because there is no, there's no way of talking about those things. Same as the language that gamers use, same as the language that drag queens use. That, that language, we don't have words in, in everyday standard English or formal English for those things. So linguists call this sometimes a lexical gap. A lexical gap is where you've got something that you want to express or you need to express and there's no word for it. So you have to invent one. And there's some very silly examples of this that um, kids, kids quite a few years ago, maybe a decade ago, were doing this thing where they would, um, they would jump up behind someone 
and give them a wedgie by pulling their underwear up or or just putting their, their hands around their face. This was this is thing that young kids did. But there's no word for that. So they invented one, glomping. And I don't think they I don't think glomping is cool anymore. And I <laughs> probably disappeared, the, the practice disappeared. But that's a that's a classic ex example where you know you need a word for that. And there wasn't a word. So you have to invent one. So this leads um right into my next question about how slangs come up and how they change as well. Um, so within these groups, are there some features of, of slangs that are more liable to change or particular reasons they might change? Um, or is it harder to kind of pinpoint that? Well, that's, that's a, it is a very good question because most people, I think, who think about slang assume that it's, um, it's language which is all about being new, being novel, which it usually is when it starts out by definition. But a lot of people assume that slang changes very quickly and that it's only about what linguists call vogue terms. A vogue term is a, a word which derives its power and its resonance from the fact that it's new, that it looks topical. Um, trying to think of an example. I mean, l l last year when people were talking of arguing about Brexit and the L um, Labour Party supporters were, were looking for nicknames for the people they didn't like within their own party, one of the nicknames they came up with was Melt. And Melt means like a stupid coward. And it had, it's, it's a nasty word, it's a slur, but it, it had this power because it was new, at least for the Labour Party activists, um, they actually picked it up from regional slang. But, you know, a word like that has a special power because it's new. And then when, that, when the situation among the Labour Party activists changes, the word loses its power. It may still be there, but it starts to sound dated, starts to sound old fashioned and eventually, or maybe quite quickly, it'll disappear. So there are slang words, which are vogue words, especially, especially for young, young people, school kids. Um, they, they like to learn a new word, which makes them cool, and they like to use that word. And of course, if it's overused, or if it spreads from the peer group out into general usage, it's not cool anymore. Um, but they don't go away. People may abandon these words because they're no longer, they no longer see them as exciting or new. But very often the words will then be picked up by a younger generation or a younger cohort or by people in a different region. These slang words spread out from the micro group and sometimes they sometimes they don't, sometimes they never escape. You have uh, what linguists call um, one's idiolect. An, an idiolect is your own private dialect. It's the language which you as an individual tend to use, the, you know, your favourite words or words you've invented. When it gets outside your idiolect, it may, it may form part of a restricted sociolect, which would be your friends, your clique, um, your peer group. And then it can escape from the group into larger and larger groups. And this is what happens to slang. So I think what's important is it doesn't disappear. Most of it, a lot of it, we can't be sure, spread slowly through different aspects of different groups in society. And a lot of the slang which young people are still using, I mean, think of the words like that I'm sure you know, I don't know if you use them, but, uh, the words that young people use that when they're, they're saying something is good and they say it's peng or it's len or it's piff or it's gully. And there's all sorts of words, lots of words for this, you know, that basically means cool and admirable, um, um, fit, buff, all of these positives. And those words, those, a lot of young people think that that's quite fresh and new. They've been around for 20 years. They've just, they've just been picked up by different groups. And a lot of slang, especially, especially teenage slang and street slang, um, new terms are generated all the time, but they don't always catch on. 
And a lot of the, I, I talk about the core, the common core of slang that most people know, for example, is, is quite old. It's much older usually than they think. Right. Um, is there then this sort of instinct to try and differentiate yourself, um, kind of form your in-group, your clique, so on? Is, is this something we see throughout history? Yes, although um, I think the motivate the basic motivation for the creation of of, of these in group language varieties and slang, the basic motivation has always been the same, which is to to create uh, a new identity and very often to create what begins as a secretive identity. That's why you need, again, new language that other people don't learn. So you don't know. If you go back to the very first records we have in English, there are older records in languages like Turkish, for example, of uh, uh, examples of slang going back right to the 12th or 13th century. Um, the earliest examples we have in English of slangs are from the 16th century. And in those days, I'm sure there were lots of other slangs. Probably students had their own slang in the 16th century, but we don't know it because it left no record. What we do have is that law enforcers, constables and judges, for example, made little collections as scholars, uh, made little collections of language that they've heard, which was used by crooks and swindlers and con men and criminals um, because they wanted to learn this secret language that these these wrongdoers evildoers were using so that they could help the public to not be conned to not have their goods stolen to not be tricked so they made these little lists of of what was the language of um aggressive beggars homeless people who were trying to con people out of money and things like this. And these were the first lists of sort of criminal slang, if you like, the first record. But there have always been slangs. But until recently, slang was really only a spoken variety of English. So a, a lot of it was never collected. And even in my small way, when I started collecting slang, recording it and, and listening to it and interviewing people and writing it down. Um, this was in the late 80s, really, when I started. I, a lot of it, there wasn't anybody else doing it. So the, there must have been a lot of very rich and exciting slang around that hasn't really been picked up. In the 17th and 18th and especially in the 19th century, we do have more serious dictionaries of slang that scholars uh, compile. And the, these look more like the dictionaries we have today because they're well organized and they, they're kind of based on a more scientific approach to language. So, but that language is funny also that when you look at the old slang, uh, some people seem to love it. I, I find most of it sounds really silly. I can't, I, you know, some people are absolutely delighted when they hear that in the, 19th, in the 18th century, a jealous person was called a windsucker. And um, if, you were, if you were a bit fickle and people couldn't depend on you, they called you a, a nose of wax. Now, I've got absolutely no idea what that image means. It's gone. So that, you know, the kind of imagery people, also it doesn't sound very interesting, but it sounds silly. So slang does date because 18th century slang now sounds completely ridiculous, I think, with, of course, exceptions, because there are words, bus is one, and mob is another, which began as slang. Um, bus was Parisian student slang for the carriages, which they used to crown lots of people into, public, like public transport, and they used the Latin word omnibus, everybody. Um, everybody was packed into the bus, so they call it an omnibus. And then the French students shortened it to, to bus. And we picked it up, uh, English students picked it up as the word bus, 
And if you were really cool, you called the carriages and the first, uh, you know, the first um, motorized one, you called them buses. And that spread into normal language. And the word mob was Latin, mobile vulgus, the mobile crowd. Um, and again, it was it, a lot of slang in those days was learned people from Oxford, people who who could sophist play with language in a sophisticated way. Some slang words originated from those sources, but only a few, I think, have really lasted hundreds of years like that. Uh, so how how do you go about studying slang, be it contemporary or? Um... Yeah, especially when it's so dated, finding the records and so on, or going into contemporary in groups and getting it, into the secretive thing must be quite a challenge. It is. No, I think it's very challenging. And there's a famous um, sociolinguist called Michael Halliday, who was one of the first, this is as late as 1976, 78, when he wrote about what he called anti-languages, because he thought that in those days, in the, we used to think about society and alternative society. Um, we don't really think like that so much now, but he, he called slangs anti-languages. And he said that they always come from within the peer group. But he also, this is a teacher and linguist, sociolinguist, he said that of all the socializing environments, um, the family, the workplace, in all, for, of all the environments where we learn to communicate, the peer group is the most difficult to penetrate. Uh, it's the most difficult for outsiders to get access to. And that's still true today. And especially, look at me. I mean, it's absurd that I'm talking about youth slang at my age. Um, but, you know, I have been doing it a long time, but it is, it is very difficult to penetrate these in-groups. And even more, slang used to be, as I say, almost exclusively spoken. And I was always a bit uncomfortable with people, other people who made slang dictionaries, and they based it only on what they could find in written sources. So they would look in novels, they'd look in film scripts, they look at television scripts and they find slang and they put it in their dictionary. For me, very often, that wasn't really authentic slang because the authentic slang was what people were using on the street, in the playground, in the club. And the only way to get that is in those days, starting at the end of the 80s, is to go out and listen to people and then talk to people and try to mobilize people to give you examples. So I would try to set up, and I still do this, try to set up networks of real people who can talk about it, I can listen to, we can discuss it, but also they will go out and they'll collect slang for me from their friends because otherwise it's not really authentic. That's still true, but the one thing has changed and in a way made it a little bit easier. Recently, People are communicating, of course, online with messaging, social media, other platforms. And so it's possible to monitor their language um, by going online or, or even by asking for access to messages and things like that. And this is a way, this is a fundamental change because they're using the language that they would probably use on the street, the language they use with their private group of friends, but now they're using it on the internet. So people like me, who we couldn't really eavesdrop, you know, on anybody who was out there using this language, although we'd like to have done it, we're not allowed to go and bug their houses and record them. Um, it's always been illegal, and that was frustrating for me. Now that we can go online and we can look at their chat rooms or their discussion groups or their fan websites um, or their messages or their emails, and we can see them. And what has happened, which is fundamentally different, is that a spoken variety, slang, has become a written variety as well. 
And so it makes it more accessible. And I think that's the big change in the last few years. Um, of, course, of course, a lot of it is still secretive and uh, inaccessible. And again, I still try to talk. I don't think you can be a slang. You can be a lexicographer making dictionaries if you only live in libraries and archives um, and museums and, and whatever. You, I, I've always thought that you, you to be a slang uh, lexicographer or linguist, you have got to talk to real people. You've got to go out and do field work, uh, which is essentially going out and doing action research, research in the field. And that means talking to real people. And I think that's still true. So where, when you go off and do that, is it slightly different to ordinary speech because um, I can't explain the rules of English, but if I'm a member of um, if I'm member of a slang sort of speech community, I can say, well, here's what this means quite specifically and when you would and wouldn't use it. Um, are these things more consciously constructed than the, the sort of non-slang variants? I think it, it varies from individual to individual because and this is another, it's a very good point. What I try and do, if possible, is identify, if I meet a group of people, there's always usually one or two who are what I call the slang impresarios or the slang experts. And these are the ones, because a lot of people, that not, not just young people not using slang, most people take their, their everyday language completely for granted. You may not because you're, you know, you're, you're an intellectual and, and you're highly educated. But I think, it, uh, and this sounds horrible, really, it sounds really patronizing of me to say this, but most normal people don't think about the language they're using. I think it, it comes naturally to them and they think that it's natural. Of course, it isn't natural. It's always constructed and negotiated. But so what you, what you do find though is, and this is another very important point. People think uh, a lot of adults and teachers and police officers and government officials, uh, politicians think uh, young people who use language are, are as I've said, deficient, that, that it's sloppy language. Or, and, and I've tried to, tried to explain to people that it isn't. It's quite sophisticated language. But just like ordinary people using normal language, most people use slang don't really spend a lot of time thinking about it. They're not what linguists call reflective or reflexive. They just use it and they, they know it by heart. You know? But there's usually somebody, at least in every group, who actually is interested in, oh, I'm interested, where did that word actually come from? And yeah, I know why it sounds right when they use it and it doesn't sound right. And someone who has a reflective, um, self-conscious attitude to the language they use. And if you can find those people, they're really interesting. Um, but no, I think they're in a minority, but this is the people who, who actually know, not just what the words are, but why, they, why one word sounds more interesting than another, whether one word is newer than another. So there are experts down on the streets, in the fan fiction groups, um, among the cosplayers, um, I mean, there's a there's a group I'm never going to be able to penetrate, but uh, they exist. Uh, so you mentioned um, Brexit earlier and the slangs, uh, or slang words that were formed in response to that. Um, how do you slangs arise in response to? Do they arise characteristically in response to external events, or is it, you know, some things are more important than others? It's hard to tell. The, um, when you have something which is really socially significant, and usually it's something which is um, unfortunately a, a kind of crisis of some kind, um, and you and when you something which creates division or unease in the public, then this always generates a lot of new language. People people are energized and agitated about something, and, and then they again try to find new words for for this new 
dynamic dramatic experience. So something like populist politics, and uh, you know, populist politics in general, not just Brexit, uh, it's the same with Donald Trump's, um, the, the kind of culture surrounding Donald Trump's rise to power. But there's an enormous amount of divisiveness and antagonism, stress being generated in connection with the, these political events. And so you get people who want to disagree with each other, violate, to insult each other, to belittle and denigrate each other. That's one thing. So you get a huge um, I, I would sort of influx of new kinds of slurs, um, slang nicknames. I mean, again, just talking about the Labour Party, um, when Jeremy Corbyn was controversially the leader, um, you know, they were talking about centrist dad. The centrist, you know, is the, is the middle aged kind of middle of the road guy who may be slightly left, but he's they think he's they hate him because they think he's enabling the right because he's not far left enough. So they coin this nickname, this slur, which is like a slang slur. And then you've got, you know, for Jeremy Corbyn himself, you've got this people calling him magic grandpa. Uh, or the absolute boy, ironically, which is a kind of Irish term of admiration. And so you get all these strange, exotic new phrases being generated out of a situation which is really a, a kind of social crisis. And you have the same with the COVID pandemic. Um, I've been tracking, I don't only track slang at all, I'm trying to record all kinds, uh, all examples of new language, of novel language. And the other word which I, I need to stress that linguists use is non-standard. I'm only personally only interested in tracking non-standard language, not the technical language of politics, but the nicknames um, and the slang of politics is what I'm interested in. Even with something like the pandemic, you have uh, I, I track, uh, uh, I'm contradicting myself because I did record the technical language and the political language. I was more interested in the, the slang which was thrown up. And again, when you have uh, a situation where a whole society is suddenly in turmoil, you have a lot of new language. And there's an enormous amount of slang which I, I recorded in connection with COVID and Corona virus. Um, all the slang about working at home, you know, um, Zoom bombing, um, a, a Zoom mullet, which is what I've got, because the Zoom mullet is a new hairstyle which looks camera ready at the front and Donald Trump at the back. And again, there was no, there was no word for that. And now we've got one. And people talking about having a quarantini, they're desperate for a, a cocktail um, or a locktail at the end of the day. So all these kind of funny, slangy, colloquial terms that have been generated, but they've been generated by a social crisis. And this is quite common. And again, I find it interesting, even though the, a lot of the humor is quite black. Um, but some of, it I, some of it I think is quite funny. I mean, for example, I'm wearing today what, what's nicknamed an infit. It's the opposite of an outfit because I only need to wear it indoors because I'm locked down uh, working from home. And it's worse than that because I'm only wearing, don't be shocked, I'm wearing upperwear. <laughs> it's the opposite of underwear. Now, I don't worry, I, I have got, because it doesn't matter what I'm wearing below the waist. And in fact, I'm wearing tracksuit bottoms, trackies, so it's okay. But the, you know, again, these silly words, have been invented and are being exchanged um, because they because they describe a new reality, a shared reality, and that that's true about particularly about slang, about nicknames. So you've you've mentioned humour a few a um, few times there, and um, how do people use slang to to sort of how instrumental can it be to their own inside jokes and things that would make no sense to the the out group oh well a, a tremendous amount of slang again especially among young people is kind of inherently funny and it's meant not it's meant to sometimes it's meant to be really serious or cruel but it often sounds funny 
even the sound of the word you know when they uh, there's some of the words that i like i can't use them because i'm too old but my kids i've got a um, son of 21 and a daughter of 13 they use these terms and you know they a lot of them sound funny but they're quite complex they're not simple blocks he's blocks he's well blocks or they're bare blocks and i don't know if you know this word or use it but it sort of means it means kind of way heavily built um hench um blench there's all these words and they sound silly and funny and they're meant to sound silly and funny but they're actually used quite often to be rude about people but in a jokey way and then you get a lot of youth slang is 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 categorizing people um, and judging them. And this is usually done at least superficially in a funny way. So that's where you get a, a long time ago, you got words like back in the 70s, nerd and geek describing there was no there was no way of saying nerd or geek. it had to be invented. Those categories didn't, they, I guess they existed, but there was no way of talking. About. Now you have, of course, more recently, the neek who is both a nerd and a geek. And then there's an adjective, neeky, to describe them. You know? And it sounds funny, but it can also be cruel. So you know, that slang, slang very often has, um, has a kind of humorous aura. I mean, again, if you go back to really old slang from the 18th century, um, instead of saying someone was puzzled, they'd say they were pitch kettled. I don't quite get it, but it's just like an old kettle that's covered with sort of coal dust or something. But it's it, you can see it's funny, even if we can't get the joke. You know, so a lot of slang, humor is a very much an integral part of slang. It, one of the things about slang is it's supposed to be casual looking. It's supposed to be unserious looking, even if it's saying nasty things. So um, with respect to categorizing people. You had mentioned status earlier and how slang gives people in the in-group as well as the out-group certain statuses. Um, are those functions related? Oh, well, again, I'm going back to um, slurs and, and categories and judgments. Yeah, I mean, I'm thinking now of maybe, maybe older from the 90s and the 2000s, the noughties, but uh, I used to listen to the slang that my students at King's College used, and there, there would be, they would have these categories which wouldn't mean anything probably to uh, outsiders, but they describe they describe not just a hierarchy of students, but an ecosystem of students. If that's not too pretentious, so you'd have um, in those days there were anoraks who were kind of serious and badly dressed. And then if they were really serious and badly dressed, they were called cagoules because they wore even more awful looking rainwear. Um, and then they, they used to be catalog man, who in the old days, now they'd order their clothes online, but they actually ordered them from those catal big glossy catalogs. And it was real. And they used to be, um, these are all categories which only existed in slang, of course. And then you get the ones which I think are still used, BMOC or BMOC. I did, have you heard this at Oxford? He's a BMOC, and it means big man on, cam on campus. And it's nearly always either envious, you know, I don't like the fact that he's a kind of prominent student, or ironic, because you think he's actually an unpleasant, annoying person. So. Uh, so that this social categorization, um, sometimes it's into hierarchies, but um, uh, in criminal gangs, for example, they, they have a whole vocabulary of uh, almost like a military vocabulary of different ranks within the gangs. So there's the, the, the faces and the olders who are the senior members and the, the teenies and the clean skins looking innocent and the runners and shotters who are the junior ones who do the errands. So again, they, they've got a, a, an intricate slang vocabulary for the for the hierarchies in their social group. Studying criminal slangs must have been, well, um, exciting, but also uh, quite quite difficult to, to manage. Um, 
Yes, um, and again, it seems it, it, it does seem ironic that it's someone like me attempting to do this, someone who, who no longer can easily blend in on the street. Or, or, but I, I've had interesting experience. I started to talk to gang members quite a long time ago when I could find them. And you know, usually I was put in contact with them by their friends who kind of would vouch for my the fact that I wasn't a police officer, you know. So, um, and I, actually, I was quite surprised. And I, I've I've uh, researched with um, adult criminals, older criminals, some of them hardened criminals, and with prisoners, people people actually locked up because the prison prison, of course, has a has a has a rich secret slang. Um, but it is potentially dangerous. But I, I must say, I haven't had any problems um, so far. And again, what is happening now? This this is a really interesting aspect of my work, which I never expected. Although I was recording gang slang and criminal slang going back quite a long way, and the only way to do it again was to actually go and uh, and meet these people usually, because they didn't write down what they were doing. Nowadays. Um, drill music enthusiasts, rap enthusiasts, who may, not not all of them, of course, but some of whom are actually on the street and living in gang culture, they do write about what they're doing. They send messages and they even compose rap songs and rap lyrics to talk about and boast about their activities. Um, and I, I've, you know, I've been looking just this week at um, electronic diaries and notebooks kept by gang members, in which they, they seem to be celebrating, you know, the the, the violence, the drug dealing, the sexual prowess um, in in slang language. Um, so this is all written down, which, which seems to me bizarre because it means it's accessible potentially to outsiders and. I'm also I'm also asked again I'm doing this right at the moment I'm asked to go to court sometimes or to help um, prosecutors police or defense lawyers defense lawyers who are trying to defend young people who've been involved in gang activity because nobody in the court really well there are policemen and social workers and and teachers and defense lawyers who can understand a bit of street slang but they can't, they're not usually fluent in it. And there's almost surprisingly nobody else they can turn to. They have to turn to me because I've been recording this kind of language. And I wouldn't say I'm fluent in it, but I, I recognize a lot of the terms and I've recorded them. So if there's a criminal case where the evidence is all about things that have been written or said in slang, they need uh, what's called an expert witness or a, uh, an expert linguist to come and translate and interpret this language, to explain what it actually means. And I've been doing this, it's something I never expected to do. I, I didn't have any intention of becoming a, an ally of prosecution or defense in legal cases, but there aren't many other people. As I say, there's a lot of people who understand the language, but they can't pose as an expert you can't put them up on the stand in the court and they, they don't unfortunately have the credibility to speak as an expert. So this is another kind of language of, of, of activity that I've become involved in that, that is it's fascinating, but it's also distressing and disturbing because the kind of language you look at are what it's describing on the streets in inner cities and via extreme rap and drill lyrics as well. Uh, the, uh, these activities themselves are very disturbing. So, sorry. Um, uh, so, I don't know, I'm sorry about that. No, Somebody, no, no, no. Somebody's Zoom bombing me or team <laughs> bomb, team bombing. We have, that's a new, t I've just invented, or we've invented a new term, team bombing, so. So, uh, you mentioned rap lyrics. How does slang come up in um, cultural artifacts like uh, art and music and poetry, but for the in-group itself? Well, um, especially in musical genres, and this has always been the case to certain 
certain extent, but not, not perhaps so much in the past, but um, music that's basically come from the hip hop tradition, so particularly rap music and, and things like genres um, like grime and now drill is very fashionable. And these, all of these take, they take their imagery and their, their kind of ideology from the street. And they, they try to replicate the, the authentic language of the street. So inevitably they, go, they are using a lot of slang. They don't, uh, people sometimes think that these musical performances and creations are creating slang, but they, I don't think they do this. They're, they're, what they do is they appropriate slang, which is, which is already used somewhere. A lot of it obviously is coming from African-American English used on the streets in the United States. And it's picked up by the, by the writers of songs, by the rappers and by the performers. And then it passes into lyrics and then from there, people elsewhere, uh, people who aren't living on the street can pick up this language. So you used to get it, used to get, uh, and you still do, slang would be used in, in movies, in TV drama, which were trying to reflect, um, you know, the, the behavior of the police or criminals or soldiers. So they would use the slang of those groups. And again, people could pick this up. But I think you get a much, much bigger proportion of it in hip hop culture and rap music, for example. But this is, it's the language of the streets, which has been adopted, borrowed, and then re returned to the streets in a way. So there's a constant sort of a, a circular um, activity, a sort of exchange between the producer, the consumer, and then the producer again of this language. Um, you do find slang in novels, in fiction, in book fiction, but um, I mean, my son says that nobody reads books anymore. And I, I, I don't think I read books anymore, but I, I shouldn't say this in the context of Oxford University, but you do still get books published, which seek, which look for authenticity by using slang. And it, it, it doesn't always work very convincingly, but there are books. And uh, um, so poetry, I, I, I don't really follow, um, there are, quite vigorous examples of poetry, I think, in the UK at the moment, in, in some urban environments, but they tend to be located in small clubs. The poetry, but poetry doesn't seem to have a mass audience. So uh, I think there is a certain amount of slang, but I, it's not something that I come across very often. And it's not something that I think is salient or, or very prominent in, in in the, in the slang ecosystem in general. So with the um, with the internet, we've seen a huge growth of slang, and we've mentioned it sort of dotted throughout the conversation so far. Um, things like Stan Twitter and gamers and so on. Um, does this serve the same function virtually that you identify? groups and give them statuses uh... it, it's it fulfills the traditional imperatives of slang because it's about micro niches and this is a funny I said so what I like as well because micro niches become mega niches it's like people who are into um, manga used to be a, a minority interest and activity, and it was called a micro niche. Now there are millions and millions and millions of fans and, and enthusiasts worldwide. So it's a mega niche, which is a bit of a contradiction in terms, but yes. And I, I would distinguish them. And I've just been talking, um, I've been talking to other people, students and, and teachers who are interested in slang just last week about this. That there are sort of there are lots of different slangs from different groups, but I, I try to make a distinction between two broad areas, which is I think is slightly different. There are slangs which are used online in connection with cult figures or entertainers or fashion, um, 
and gaming and and movies and entertainment and those the slangs used in all those areas tend to come from the united states because the united states still dominates um popular entertainment culture and and to some extent fashion at least the language of fashion which comes from fashionistas um people work in the fashion industry and from, from these um more exotic groups like drag queens who generated a lot of slang which has crossed over so you have all of those languages there isn't really a word for them all of those slangs but they're all kind of they're all they all tend to have the same flavor of being about fashion and entertainment on the one hand and being american in origin and being digital in that they are negotiated online so young people, we know young people, and I think there's another kind of slang though, which is very important in the UK, and that is the language that young people may use online. Certainly, some of the slang they use, but it's the language that they actually use in the school playground, on the street, with their friends, and. In the UK, this language is often slightly. There's a big overlap, of course. They they might use some showbiz slang, some fashion slang, some fan slang or stan slang, but a lot of the language they use is what is has been referred to as MLE, multi-ethnic London English, and this is the the kind of particularly English blend of African Caribbean terminology and African Caribbean accent, intonation, pronunciation, Afri not just African Caribbean, but Asian too. So this is the slang, which sometimes people people laugh at and call it Jafakan, fake Jamaican, or they or they ridicule it and call it ghetto language, which is very racist. But uh, the language I'm talking about is and, and you can't say these words with my accent. You can't say the uh, received pronunciation accent because it's all about like man in it. You know what I mean? You're down on the street and uh, with the with man's dem and gal's dem, and uh, we got bare bollocks, man, and guap. Now I'm sorry if that sounds ridiculous. It is ridiculous, but you can't say those words in a in a an elderly adult accent and this is the language and it's a fascinating language because it, it contains a lot of slang it's not it's kind of almost all slang but it's a whole dialect or sociolect and uh, it, it's been called mle multi-ethnic london english a lot of linguists and me included don't like that to uh, label because it's really no longer just to do with london it was identified in london but the same kind of language is used in all the urban environments in the UK. And now kids in village schools speak with in the, using the same accent sometimes and the same words. And what it's called, linguists refer to these kinds of mixed dialects as multi-ethnolects because they contain elements of, of speech varieties, vocabularies from more than one different ethnic group. And MLE, some of us have started calling it UBE, Urban British English. Um, the people who first identified it, um, the sociolinguists who identified it, now call it multi ethnolect. And it's not confined to the UK. If you go to France, there's a, there's a, a parallel multi ethnolect, but it's based much more on North African language, mixed with native French. Just as uh, MLE or UB is a lot of African Caribbean language, some Asian language, even a little bit of Polish and Turkish and Somali, mixed in with um, an older sort of London street language. So this is a, a kind of a whole fascinating matrix, nexus of language, which is another sort of slang. And I would sort of differentiate the slang which people use to create a fashionable persona online is much more directed at celebrity culture and, and fashion, the fashion industry. The language people, uh, 
the language people use on the street, Ali or Yubi, is still has a different kind of ideology, if that's the right word. It's still based on street credibility and street cool. And that's different. So it has a different vocabulary and a different pronunciation and intonation. And, and I think it's fascinating, although it's, it's often mocked, um, people started mocking it back in the 90s. I don't know if anybody um, in your generation knows who Ali G was. People think now that maybe he was racist. He wasn't. He was, I don't think so. He was cruelly mocking these fake street gangsters who would dress and talk as if they were um, African Caribbean. And that was, since then, there have been other attempts to mock this kind of language. There was a, a program which I found very f um, called Phone Shop, which is about um, people, people, much older people, people aged in their 20s, 30s, and 40s who were working selling mobile phones in Croydon. And they all spoke in multi-ethnic London English. And it was absolutely absurd because they were mainly white and very uncool and very unstreet credible. So this, this was, you know, this kind of language has already been parodied, but it isn't just parody. People speak it, they use it. Um, and I think it's socially and linguistically fascinating and important. Um, you mentioned how a lot of the um, the the slang words come from the United States, and we actually have a, a member submitted question about that. That um, do you think that the internet slang is going to become more linguistically diverse as these kind of cultures become more uh, integrated across the world? Um, you know, are there going to be slang phrases that become more frequent in other languages that don't come necessarily in the United States, or is that something you don't see changing? Um, I would say, as a generalization, we don't see it yet. Um, I and a lot of other linguists got very excited about 10 or 15 years ago about the interchange of language between African-American, African-Caribbean and, and white English and white American slang and the way they seem to be merging and blending. But it hasn't happened as much with other languages. So I think what we've got, it, it's still that in the US, US slang is dominant. Some of it has always been imported into the UK, but probably in a way even maybe, no, not less, but it, it's British street slang has taken on a kind of pride in itself and an importance as well. So that there, there isn't, and it doesn't go back the other way very much. Uh, Jamaican uh, language has affected urban American, African American language enormously. A lot of it actually in both Britain and the United States originated in the Caribbean. But to answer your question, uh, it's pretty much a one way traffic, I think, from the United States into global English popular culture via popular culture. What you, uh, and, and it hasn't happened, we thought that there'd be a kind of global, multicultural, new form of English would evolve. What has happened though, is, is equally interesting. What you have is local varieties of English in all these other parts of the globe. So there's Honglish in Hong Kong, Spanish in Spain, all sorts of different South Asian Indian Englishes um, Nigerian English, which and, th and there are slangs in all of these um, mixed varieties, if you like, but they're localized to those areas. They don't, unfortunately, they don't feed back into the sort of original core, the inner, the inner circle, as it's called, of prestigious um, global English slang is still located mainly in the US with a little bit of UK and Australia mixed in. That's where it is coming from. It may change. It would be nice if there were, if Indian English would feed back into UK and US English, but it, it isn't happening yet. We're, so we're not, we're not completely globalized yet, but there are all sorts of competing forms of English that are evolving worldwide. 
All right, and we have one more question, and I think um, that's about it. Uh, but when um when these slangs become more and more publicly integrated, um, are they are they losing their slang status as something like um you know, is rap becoming more mainstream, reducing the slang status of certain slangs and things like that? Well, I think there's, there, there may be more than one answer to that, but the one, one very simplistic answer is listen to drill rap lyrics. And I don't, I, uh, most adults have never watched a drill video. And if they do, I've witnessed them when they do, they're absolutely shocked, rigid by the, by the celebrations of violence and aggression and um, hysterical celebration of, of wrongdoing, but they're absolutely baffled by the language. That kind of radical alternative slang will not become mainstream. It just, by definition, it's all about sex and drugs and violence. And so that, those varieties of slang and, and rap and especially drill, so the extreme example uses the most uh, extreme form of street slang to describe the most extreme activities. And that will always be, uh, as it were, a, a, what's called a stigmatized variety or an outsider's variety of language. It won't cross over. You know, some of the language of fashion, some of the language maybe we, we get from movies does does infiltrate everyday conversation. But I, I think one thing about slang, if it's radical slang, and if it's very exotic slang that looks and sounds uh, interestingly different, then it, by definition, it's very difficult for it to integrate into everyday language. Look at business jargon and buzzwords. Some of that has crossed over because it's still the language of the workplace. It's the language used by respectable middle-aged adults. So it can cross over into everyday conversation. And you get people talking um, talking and using business buzzwords. Um, I, I, I always laugh when my students say they're gonna curate an online identity or they're gonna create an online persona using the kind of technical buzzwords um, that older adults use. Um, which they've adopted. But that is an edgy street slang. And edgy street slang, it, is, it relies on being outlaw language, on being language which is inadmissible. So, so I think that there's a very limited crossover. And with something like drill lyrics, just to follow up, is that because of the, um, the nature of the the slang and how sort of um, inaccessible it is, or, or is it because the slang is instructed to describe things that there are wider societal taboos about? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Drill, again, drill lyricists, I think, uh, uh, I do study it, of course I'm not an expert in that, I don't like drill music, but I have to try to come to terms with its language. I don't think the drill rappers are actually inventing language. They're still getting their language. They're taking the language from the streets, but they're taking it from genuine gang members. So the language, uh, the, the, the most obvious example, which has been featured in, in news reports is the dozens and dozens of slang words which um, gang members have for weapons. So WAP, Ching, Shank, Rambo, Ramsey, Lane, Skeng, these are all nicknames for guns and knives. And of course, those terms won't be picked up in everyday language, but they are picked up by the rappers who want to, who want to make their, um, want to carry out a shocking performance that looks authentic. So they take this genuine street slang and they they replay it, if you like, and they amplify it. So that, I think that's the process that's at work at the moment in, in the in the context of those musical genres. But not all of them. It's drill rap is the most is is a very unusual and extreme example of this. I think. 
All right. Well, I think that's it. Um, thank you very much uh, for this really wide ranging discussion. Um, I'm glad we've got to get into detail about some technical issues as well. Um, it's been really interesting. Uh, well, uh, I'm very grateful. And can I just say as a last thing, I'm, I, I used to use slang naturally myself when I was younger, but I can't do I, I'm very disappointed I can no longer do that. I can listen, record it, but I can no longer use it. And when I want to, when I want to provoke my children, I do say that something is far out or groovy or too much. And they just they and they just say you're so cringe, um, you know. And and uh, so you know it, 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 there is an element that does date. And um, and the last thing is that I always tell teachers and parents, don't try and imitate young people's slang. Don't go there. Don't try and use it because you'll never. And there's one word that everybody who's studying language and slang should remember: is appropriacy. It's a technical term that linguists and language teachers use, and it simply means using the right form of language in the right setting, the right context. And real language usage that works is all about appropriacy. So don't use slang in the job interview, in the essay, in the dissertation, or with your, grand or with your grandparents. Um, that's what it's all about, really. Use it in your peer group with your friends or write rap lyrics and then you're free to use it.